the overview out of this uh, cool spring day. Grateful for your presence. I'm sure the Lord is pleased that you are here. A couple of you have asked about uh, what's happening in Nepal. I don't really know. I, I haven't been able to hear anything so far. I'm sure there's no power in Kathmandu, and so no internet, no cell phones, no real way to communicate. But uh, as I find out some things, I'll let you know. If you weren't aware of it, there was a huge earthquake there. Uh, last report I saw on the internet was over 4,000 people have died. Uh, they felt it as far away as New Delhi in India and up around the Chinese border. Lan uh, not landslides, avalanches on Mount uh, Everest killed many people. So it's a uh, bad, bad time for them. They don't have a lot of infrastructure to start with, so they're going to need a lot of prayers and probably some help of other kinds in the near future. So keep them in your prayers at this point. A lot of Christians in that country, in the city and in the countryside. So uh, remember them and we'll see what we can find out as, about as, far, as far as how they are doing. So tragic situation. And then I read just before coming to church that they had an aftershock that was 6.7, which is stronger than a lot of earthquakes. So they are definitely suffering right now. The parable of the pounds, at least that's what the King James calls it. In the reading this morning and in the New King James Bible, it's called, they're called minus. It's money. But this parable is not about money. The parable is about the kingdom. And if we look at the context around where this parable occurs, Chapter 19 of Luke opens up with Jesus at the household of Zacchaeus. And he makes an interesting statement to Zacchaeus in verse 9. Today salvation has come to this house because he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Interesting statement. But then he goes into this parable. But we know immediately after the parable that he makes preparations for what we call his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You might remember that. That's where the people were laying palm branches in the streets and they were laying down their coats and crying out, Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus came in like a king, received like a king. And he spent the next week teaching in Jerusalem. Then those same people that cried out Hosanna in the highest a week later as he stood before Pilate and was presented by Pilate trying to get the people to ask for his release cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Could you imagine one week crying out Hosanna in the highest for Jesus and then the next week crying out crucify him? what was happening. But the people needed to understand the nature of the kingdom. Look at verse 11 of the parable again. Now, as they heard these things, the things in Zacchaeus' household, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So this parable has something to do about the kingdom and when it's going to come what it's going to be like about the nature of this kingdom. So let's see what the parable tells us. First of all, when he talks about salvation and the fact that they thought the kingdom was coming immediately, they probably equated that with the idea of the defeat of Rome. You see, the Jews thought that the kingdom was going to be the reestablished kingdom of David and Solomon. They were going to have another king, their Messiah, rise up. It's going to get rid of these foreigners. It's going to reestablish that kingdom in all of its glory. Which might help explain why he received the reception he did as he went into Jerusalem a week before the crucifixion. They thought, finally, he's going down to Jerusalem and he's going to take care of things. He's going to establish this kingdom. No. They needed to understand what actually was going to happen when he got to Jerusalem. He's going to die. He's going to have to go away. 
You see in the parable in verse 12, he talks about going into a far country to receive the kingdom. Now the Jews were familiar with this concept. Herod the Great, the one who was on the throne when Jesus was born, and then his son Antipater, the one who was on the throne when Mary, Joseph, and Jesus returned from Egypt, had both had to go to another country to receive their kingdom. They had to go to Rome. And if you ever want to read about the work of a politician, you need to read the life of Herod the Great. You see, there was a civil war in Rome. Herod backed the wrong side. And then when his side lost, he went to Rome and not only was able to make peace, but make him, get himself appointed king over Palestine. It's amazing. Usually when you back the losing side, it's not a good sign for your future. Yet he was able to bring himself to the position of king by going into that far country. Jesus is going to have to go into a far country too. Only that far country is going to be heaven. If you go back and read the seventh chapter of Daniel, he depicts what happens in verses 13 and 14. He says that we see one like the Son of Man ascending to the Ancient of Days to receive a kingdom and glory and dominion. That's Jesus going to his coronation. But he had to leave this earth to do it. He had to ascend to the Ancient of Days. You might recall the apostles one in Acts, the first chapter. As Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, they're still asking about this kingdom. Will you restore now the kingdom of Israel? But he wants them to understand the nature of the kingdom. It's going to be different. He's going to have to go away to receive this kingdom. But he's going to be opposed. In verse 14, he talked about those citizens going after the king to try and say, we don't want this man to serve as king. They're actually going to reject Jesus when he gets to Jerusalem <coughs> because of the leadership of the Jews. If you'll read John chapter 13, the Jewish leadership understood the popularity of Jesus, and they understood what that could do to them if the Romans came to realize how popular Jesus was and what so many people thought Jesus was going to do. And they determined that he needed to die. So they were, in fact, rejecting him. They just didn't understand how much they were rejecting him and what they were actually rejecting. But it's interesting, before leaving, he gave his servants something to do. He called them in, and he gave them ten units of money. I don't know what that is exactly. I can't tell you if it was dollars or euros or rupees. I don't know. It was their unit of money. Whatever it was, apparently it was a significant amount. He entrusted to them a certain amount of money and gave them some instructions. Use this until I come back. In other words, take this and use it to make more money. It's a concept we understand in this country. That's what we used to go to the bank for. At least that's what I was taught as a little child. You put your money in the bank and it makes money. I've noticed it's not making any money right now. But that's the principle. But then you can invest it with someone, and they can put it to work, and they can get you money on your investment. You get a return on that money. You make extra money. That's the concept, and it happens sometimes, I guess. We even have a TV show about it. At least I think that's what it's about. People stand before these investors and convince them that whatever product they've come up with or whatever service they've envisioned is worthy of them putting money into so that they can then make more money as that product or that service is put into play. And I've seen it a couple of times. My son likes to watch it. And I don't know how popular of something I might come up with would be. I, there's no way I'd want to stand there and have to go through what they go through to try and get that money. But anyway, the 
king says, here's the money. Now put it to work. I'll be back. When are you coming back? He doesn't say. But he left them with a job to do. Take the money and use it. Do you remember what Jesus told his apostles before he left? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, Mark says. Matthew told them that they needed to go take that gospel to the entire world and teach them everything Jesus had taught them. He was entrusting them with the work of the church. It wasn't called that quite yet, but that's really what he was doing. And it's interesting that when you look at the work that these people did, one man got ten and he made ten more. Another man got ten and he made five more. But there was a third fellow. He said, here's your money back. I know the kind of person you are. You're a hard man. And so I just took that money and put it in a napkin. I was afraid I might lose it. And so I didn't do anything with it except hold it until you came back. If you've read this parable before, you're familiar with what happened. He said, out of your own mouth, verse 22, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man collecting where I did not uh, deposit and reaping where I did not sow. Why didn't you at least put the money in the bank? Why didn't you do something with it? It's a question Jesus will have for us when he returns. He's going to come back one day. And he's going to ask, what did you do with what I've given you? Only I don't think it will be money. That might be part of it. But he's going to want to know, what did you do with the things I've given you, the talents or the abilities that you have? What did you do to promote the spread of the gospel? What did you do to help the church? What did you do that I might be glorified and honored in this world? We have a little picture of that in Matthew 25, beginning of verse 31. We've looked at that in the past. That's where Jesus calls all of his people in, and he starts separating them. By the way, those people in Matthew 25, I think, are the church, not the world. It's the church. And he separates them like a shepherd divides the sheep to the right hand and the goats to the left. And he says to the one group, I was hungry and you fed me, naked you clothed me, in prison you visited me. And to the other group he says, I was those things and you didn't do anything. It's going to be a reckoning, a day of judgment. In the parable, he comes back, and in verse 27, calls for his enemies, those who would not allow him, or would not submit to him, to be slain. Jesus is going to come back. When he does, he's going to talk to the church, Matthew chapter 25, but he's also going to talk to all those folks who denied him, all those folks who refused to submit to him. All those folks who said that he didn't really exist. If you have a Bible, turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 4. I'm sorry, verse 5. We're in the middle of the sentence here, but basically the Thessalonians have been suffering being persecuted. They're going through tribulation. But in verse 5 he says, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
They shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Notice there's two groups of people discussed. Those that don't know him and those that don't obey the gospel. They're going to be punished with everlasting destruction from his presence. Eternal destruction. Not permitted to be before him. But we sometimes ask, why does God allow certain things to happen in this world? I don't know. I'm sure the people of the first and second and third century wondered the same thing. But know this, the day will come when they will receive their just reward. He's coming, Paul said, in flaming fire, taking vengeance. Now Paul told the Romans, God said, don't take vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. You need to let the Lord take care of settling accounts. Taking vengeance on people. That's his job. And trust me, he will do far better than we could ever imagine to do. But I don't really want to see anybody receive that vengeance. Think about it. Eternally punished away from the presence of God. I don't know anybody I'd like to see that happen to. But the only way they can avoid it is to know God and to obey the gospel. And so we need to be busy with this work that he has given us, taking this precious commodity, the gospel message, salvation through Christ, talking to people about what he did for us that we just commemorated at the table, and letting them know who he is, why he did it, what they can receive, but also what God's going to expect of them. There are a lot of people who try to serve God on their terms. It's not going to work. We have to serve Him on His terms. He's the one who's God. He's the one to make that determination. Not me. I've talked to a lot of different people. They say, well, you know, I understand why he wants me to believe in him. I understand why he wants me to repent. I know why he wants me to confess him. But that baptism thing doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't have to make sense. It's what he said to do. It will make sense. It's basically the gospel in small form. The gospel message is basically this. Jesus came into this world and he died. He was buried, and he was raised again. And when you read the sixth chapter of, of Romans, that's what we do when we obey the gospel. We die to sin, we're buried with him, and we're raised to walk in newness of life. The burial, coming, and baptism. That's why Paul wrote in verse 17 that we've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, or that pattern of doctrine. Not my idea. That's why Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus and said, what are you waiting for? Or to quote the King James, why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It's a simple process. People have to do that. If they don't do it, they haven't obeyed the gospel. And I know people who understand repentance. And they'll repent for most things, but they'll have one or maybe two little things. Well, you know, I, I kind of like this, and I, I, maybe I'll give it up later. But no. It doesn't work that way. Repentance is that change. It's no longer me who's in charge. Now it's God who's in charge. 
And I'm going to turn away from all those things that he's opposed to. I'm not going to make a list of people. I ain't supposed to be too busy. And I think sometimes we get a little off-center trying to figure these things out. I used to sit around with preachers, and we'd start talking about this practice and that practice. Is it right? Is it wrong? I'm coming to the conclusion that we really need to ask this question. What's the motive behind wanting to do it? The Bible describes the, the two choices we have in this life. We can live for the flesh. That is, we can serve self and satisfaction, or we can serve the Lord, serve the Spirit. So the question becomes, is it something that's fleshly and physical, or is it something that's spiritual? Now, obviously, we can carry that to an extreme. We don't want to become like the folks that used to live out in the desert, away from everybody, and try to eat grass to live. Uh, we're just not made to do that. We have to have nourishment. We have to feed the body. We have to eat. Some of us may be a little less, but that's for another discussion. In marriage is a place God said certain physical desires need to be fulfilled. It's fine within marriage. It's when it's outside of marriage that it becomes a problem. Outside of marriage, it becomes fleshly. Inside of marriage, it's part of God's spiritual plan for mankind. It's a wholesome, healthy thing. It's a good thing. It's what God intended. It's not an abuse of it at that point, so it's not fleshly. It's spiritual. So we really need to ask ourselves a question when it comes to some of these things that we're so tempted to do is, what's the motive? Why do I want to do it? And what's the outcome going to be? Is it going to take me further away from God, or will it allow me to draw closer to God? But our basic responsibility before God is to live as He wants us to live and use what He's given us to glorify Him and spread the kingdom try and teach others about God, to show them who he is. And to show them, I think, that a lot of the characterizations people make of God today and Christians are false. A lot of false concepts about God, a lot of false concepts about being a Christian. We need to take what God has given us and show the right picture of who he is and who his people are. But the day is coming. When he comes back to take us all into that eternal portion of the kingdom where we'll get to be in his presence for all eternity if we're faithful. But he's going to take vengeance on them that don't know him and have not obeyed the gospel. It's a serious matter. We don't like to see people suffer. That's why I think when something like this earthquake that occurred in Nepal, when we finally get the opportunity to help, people are going to just, many people are going to go there physically, other people are going to help financially, because we don't want to see people suffer. Same thing when there was the earthquake in Haiti. Same, time, same thing when there are other tragedies around the world. But now we're talking about eternal suffering. It's real. People need to understand it's not some figment made up to just scare people. It's a reality. And it's forever. That means it's never going to end. Don't even like to think about it. But we have to from time to time to remember what it is we're trying to help people avoid why we exist. People used to say God has no hands but our hands or no feet but our feet. He's given us a job to do. He's going to let us do it or not do it. 
but we need to make certain that we're doing it. He will call us into account one day. He's going to say, I gave you. What did you do with it? Are you going to say, well, I knew the kind of person you were, and I didn't want to make any mistakes, so I just put it in a napkin and hid it, didn't use it. Or are you going to say, here's what I've done, and here's what the results are. So I guess the question I want to ask, I want to close with, is simply this. If the Lord comes back today, he could, but he may not. But if he does, are you prepared for that day? You see, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 13, shows the other side of that judgment scene that we looked at in 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians 1, he's telling them God's coming back to take vengeance on all those that persecute you, all those that don't know him and don't obey him. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 talks about him coming back to reward the faithful. That's when the dead in Christ are going to rise up and we're going to meet him in the air and we're all going to be with the Lord. So my question simply is this. If he were to come back today, when you stand in front of him, which is it going to be? For reward or punishment? I can't answer that question for you. Only you can answer it. So what would it be? If it's not reward, you don't have to leave in that condition. We can assist you with whatever you need to do. If you need to obey the gospel, we have a baptistry. We'll gladly take your confession and immerse you for the remission of your sins. Are you a child of God that need the prayers of the church? Perhaps you need to confess some sin. We'll gladly pray with you and for you. Simple question, which will it be? Reward or punishment? If we can help you avoid the punishment, we stand ready to do so as we stand and sing. song this morning. We will sing verse 2 only. 